systems in, embedded in communication technologies. Um, most, of the, uh, most of the concepts that we explore are uh, explained in this uh, convenient downloadable book called the Telecommunist Manifesto, and we'll cover some of those issues with Daniel here today. So I'm just going to give a, a quick introduction to some of the artworks uh, that raise some of the themes that, uh, that we talk about, and then we can go from there. So I get to show some, some fun videos. The first one is called Thimble. Thimble is an artwork uh, that we made in 2010 and 11. And, uh, and what Thimble is, is it's a, it's a microblogging platform like, like Twitter only it's implemented using a protocol from the 1970s called Finger, which uh, hasn't largely been used in a very long time, but exists on every server platform. So uh, you know, this, uh, this raises the question of why we need centralized platforms like Twitter when we've already had decentralized status updates available since the 1970s. So here is a little promotional video that we made for the project, which is again a couple of years ago. platform that was implemented over the, over the finger protocol, which is, uh, has existed for quite some time. Another one that we did was uh, called, uh, was called uh, R15N, and I'll show you a video about it now. R15N uh, uses another, even older networking technique called a telephone tree, and, uh, and it's, uh, it allows users to send messages to a community, so to broadcast a message again like you would on Twitter. But the way that it works is instead of actually uh, broadcasting it, it actually puts random people on the phone to each other, and they have to pass on your message with voice, actually one to one. So it's uh, it's a telephone tree, and we're gonna uh, show you a little little video that we made for that. Hopefully, the sound will be better on this one. R fifteen N. R fifteen N will help you get your message out. Go to R15N, sign in, push the button on the R15N website, and you'll be connected to a random person from your community. R15N will then create an ad hoc telephone tree, connecting random community members. As the community works together to spread the message, R15N creates community engagement. There's no charge to you or your community. Try R15N today. The revolutionization of communication. Sorry about the sound issues. R15N. R15N will help you get your message out. Go to R15N, sign in, push the button on the R15N website, and you'll be connected to a random person from your community. R15N will then create an ad hoc telephone tree, connecting random community members. As the community works together to spread the message, R15N creates community engagement. There's no charge to you or your community. Try R15N today. The revolutionization of communication. Right, so that's R15N, and that's, uh, that's an ongoing work. We still implement that quite, a, quite often, so you can still you can sign up and participate. It's a, it's a live project. And the main point of R15N is it's meant to make people reflect on the way information goes through networks and how, and, and how anybody that's in the path of the communication has the opportunity to change the message, to not pass the message on, which is, of course, true for, for all kinds of networks as well. And again, we'll talk more about that in a minute. 
And this is an upcoming one that we're working on that we're going to launch at Transmediala next year in February. And uh, this one is uh, also. So for this piece, we're pretending to be building a global pneumatic tube network that will allow, allow physical delivery uh, of physical objects, instead, like along with internet objects. So you can actually just buy something on the internet and have it come by tube to your house. And so, but uh, the entire presentation is going to be always addressed to investors and entrepreneurs. So we'll be stressing the point that how financially valuable exclusive control over a network is and, and, how, and how great this will be to spy on the users. We can open the canisters and see what's in there and we can prevent you know, dangerous materials from being, from being sent around. And so that's, uh, so that's, um, that's Octo. And right, so the, the, main, the main running theme in all of these, all of these projects right, is, that, is that communication is a public good, much like education or much like health or, much the, or the rail system. And in previous, in previous times, like when we were building the mail, the postal system, or the telephone system, uh, we took these things very seriously socially, and we, and, and we did them publicly, and we, had, and we assigned rights, and we created laws about, about, uh, about privacy um, that you know from the legislation about opening mail, for instance, is still very tight, right? And then the internet came around, and that was a very, very exciting time for many people. And, and what made it so exciting was that it was you know, supposed to be uncensored, un, uh, unmediated communication, that where people could connect directly to each other. And there was a lot of excitement about that that uh, led to the formation of like the EFF and all kinds of other organizations to, to, to really promote and fight for this idea of openness. But this became ultimately incompatible with capitalism and the needs of commercialization because in order, in order for platforms to capture profit on a platform, they have to somehow control the users, either by controlling their interactions or controlling their data in order to be able to make money either directly by charging for things or by selling that data. So because there's no, kind of com there's no business model for capitalism that's compatible with free networks, what we had, this incredible decentralized platform that people were already using to do status updates, share pictures, citizen journalism, uh, all kinds of things were already happening on the early internet using protocols like IRC, email, Usenet, Finger, etc. All of those have been more or less replaced by centralized web applications. And the reason for that is because those centralized applications are much better at doing one thing, which is collecting information about the users and controlling their interaction. And the only, and the only reason we need to do that is in order, in, in order to make profit for investors. And that's, uh, we'll continue on that theme for now, but then we'll take it over to Daniel he can continue. Hello, is it on? Okay, yeah, uh, I'm <coughs> Daniel from SecuShare and at SecuShare we are developing software to go back to the good old days of the internet with technologies of today and usability of today because um, what we see as one major problem is that the decentralized protocols and uh, technologies and server systems from from 10 years ago are really hard to use so you have to be half a computer scientist to set up everything in a decentralized way and if we can somehow package decentralizing technology into something that our grandmothers and grandfathers can understand we can probably flatten the hierarchies in the internet again and we are now going even one step further than email or IRC did where we had lots of small servers but each of these servers had uh, several users and they were still dependent on the server 
we want to solve with peer-to-peer <laughs> -peer technology so everybody becomes his or her own server and client in one. So we flatten the hierarchy even further and nobody depends on infrastructure anymore that is hosted by some centralized entity like a big corporation or a nation, sta nation state. And we hope that with this technology we can bring a change to the internet and help people prevent the internet becoming television 2.0 because uh, in, in large parts of the net and mostly the web which is all the stuff that happens over HTTP like Facebook and Google and all the websites they are becoming more and more centralized and more redacted and filtered and whatnot and we clearly see the uh, development into the direction of really having television but with a back channel so you can pay more efficiently so in the in the worst case scenario big parts of the web would in probably five years become something where you just subscribe to stuff and you can only send out really limited amounts of data which you already had when ADSL was, was introduced like asymmetric digital subscriber line where you had lots of bandwidth to download stuff but not much bandwidth to upload stuff so the asymmetry between consumer and producer was built in into the technology we even had symmetric 56k modems so we could connect our computer to the internet and everybody could phone in with the same bandwidth that we could phone out so we could set up mailboxes and everybody could visit our mailbox and look at our content and we want to get back there again because uh, as a really smart person put it right now all of us can be co-moderators on radio stations like Facebook and Google but if the moderators get fired or the station gets closed down nobody can distribute any content anymore and then we have a problem for example um, Twitter and Facebook helped really much with the revolutions uh, in the Middle East last year would on whatever chance Facebook just have decided to not support these movements and to just cancel all the accounts they would probably have had a problem probably they would have set up something else but it would have taken some time and energy and it would have hindered the revolution and probably yeah we, we don't know what would have happened but it would have been bad so what can we do to yeah make people less dependent on not even other people because in a peer-to-peer -peer network you're dependent on your friends because these are the nodes you trust these are the nodes where you can store content on where you can relay packets, where you can even back up your data. If we have a network that we can trust because it's our friend and we have a social graph and sufficient security and free software to run it on, we can even just store our data at our friends and not in the cloud, hosted by somebody we don't know and who will probably not even keep our data or do something worth with it. With it. And um, yeah, this is my background. And now we, yeah, we want to talk a little more about how we can, as a society and not just as users, because it should not be only the responsibility of us, it should be the responsibility of everybody, like nation states, NGOs, big corporations, to devise some way of giving the public, and by public I mean really everybody, decentralized or at least accessible, free, open and neutral ways of communication. And we were there 10 years ago and it gets worse. Laws like ACTA are trying to uh, yeah, lessen our rights because of copyright industry's uh, interests. And yeah, it's, it's been a pretty rough climate for the internet in the last years and we need to act on that. And yeah, but Dimitri will tell you something about the problems with the revenue models there a little more, in which he started already. There's uh, one, of the th one, of the, one of the points that we make very, very often in our work and our presentations is that, is that the problem is not technological. The problem is political. A lot of people assume, oh, once again, we've got some audio problems. That's technological. That's not political, I hope. <laughs> I don't know. But let's see that. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. So, like, Often, often you see projects being started that, uh, that attempt to implement decentralized networks in one form or another. Uh, like SecuShare, for instance, is one of my favorites, one of the most ambitious and well thought out uh, 
platform. Another one is Unhosted, which is trying to bring uh, decentralized storage to web applications, which are popular. Uh, so there's um, Telehash, which is a really a very nice uh, decentralized hash information uh, exchange. So there's a, at a technological level, we have a lot of the tools and bits of technology that we need to actually build decentralized systems. And of course, that's no surprise, because the internet was decentralized from the beginning. That's, that, that was the whole point of its design. So decentralized architecture was inherent in how it was built. So the problem is not technological. It's not a lack of good ideas, a lack of technologists, a lack of engineers. The problem is political. In order to build systems that can support the communication needs of billions of people, if we're talking about global communication systems, you need quite a bit of money. There has to be investment. There has to be social investment in these platforms. In the same way we have to socially invest in the university or in the healthcare system or the roads or keeping the, street, keeping the streets clean. If we really want accessible public communications, then we have to invest in it. And this investment takes a lot of money, right? Millions and millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, in some, depending, on, depending on what you're talking about. And today, the only source of that investment, the only source of that money, is venture capital, right? And so it's not that venture capital, it's important to understand that it's not that the people that run Facebook or Twitter um, are somehow sinister, anti-decentralization uh, you know, conspiracists, right? Uh, it's not that they don't like decentralization. It's, it's just that in order for them to get the money to build these platforms, right, they need to have a profit model because their investors are investing in order to get profit back. So like when, well, when we build something socially, like universities or hospitals, we don't necessarily do that because we want to make profit back. So it gives us a wider range of options. They have to capture profit, which means that these systems have to capture profit. And there are only a few ways of doing that. And decentralization makes this more complicated. Because since the 1950s, um, the, the, the advertising model has been used to fund public communication channels, starting with network television, right? So network television was built out already in the 1950s based on this model. So when people like Mark Zuckerberg approach investors, they can do so using a business model that is very familiar with them. How are we going to make money with this platform? We're going to get millions of people and we're going to sell advertising to them. How else are we going to make money? We're going to, we're going to collect data about them and we're going to use that and we're going to use that data to sell to, to people who want to study their behavior and learn to control it, right? So the, what Facebook is selling to its investors is the capacity for surveillance and behavioral control. And this has been the essence of the communication business model already since network television. It's always has been. There has never been a different one. This has always been the basis of investment in communication platforms, right? So, the, so that's, that's, a, that's really important to understand. So it's not that it's, not that, it's, not that it's just like the engineers of Facebook are not clever enough to make, a, to make a distributed architecture. Far from it. Because actually, if you're trying to build a platform for billions of people, Decentralized architecture is the only way to do it. So Facebook is itself a, a mini internet. Behind the walled garden is a fully decentralized system. And in fact, Facebook has contributed uh, many pieces of important software to the free software community in order to help build decentralized infrastructure like Cassandra and, 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 and systems like that. So what these systems are, they're kind of like they're kind of like cardboard mainframes, like a cardboard box looks like a mainframe put over an actual decentralized network. And so you're stuck on the outside and you can only communicate it through this pretend centralization. Like Facebook.com is a single point. It gives the illusion this is just one single web server somewhere. But it's not, of course. The, it, could not, it, can, it can never support a billion users if it was. It itself is fully distributed. But the idea of the internet, what made it exciting, was not that there would be a series of walled gardens with decentralized computing behind them with everyone else using client-server technology like the web to communicate with them while fully controlled by those interactions. The original idea of the internet was that we would all be part of these decentralized systems and all of our computers would make up the internet and services would be not based on single data centers that provide a service. Software was intended to run on your computer and communicate with software running on other people's computer and exchanging information. That was the original concept of the internet. And I think Sekishare is trying to go back to this kind of vision. Right? Yeah, and um, there we would have a scenario where everybody would just set up some kind of software, whether it be Sekishare or RetroShare or Tripler or some, some kind of peer-to-peer -peer architecture. You would just 
install software, this would be easy. Then you would contribute resources like CPU time, memory, hard disk space, and bandwidth to the network. Now, suddenly, all the cost of keeping up such a network goes to the users. So every user contributes something, like taxes. If you live in a nation state, like most of the people do right now, you're paying taxes so education can be built up. You're paying taxes so we can have a public health system, roads, whatever. Um, participating in a peer-to-peer -peer network could be seen as, as a yeah, well-meaning tax for using the infrastructure that all of us build. And now the, the, the problem lies in funding the development of these technologies because you still have to code the stuff and this takes uh, probably lots of people because it's not such an easy work, it's not done in an afternoon. And then to really make it perform well, we need to get away from these asymmetric internet that we have right now at our homes. Because if you want to contribute bandwidth to, to a network where lots of people participate and where lots of people probably want to download uh, large amounts of data, like movies that you made or big amounts of pictures or whatever. It's not really feasible to do it with these microscopic upload rates that we have right now. So we either need to change the, the internet connections at our homes or we have to set up bigger nodes, at, for example, at universities or uh, shared virtual service at some data center. And for, if, if, you, if you are 100 people in your circle of friends or just a 50, the probability is pretty high that you have one or two nerds in there who can host a server for all your friends. And this would be pretty easy because you would, as a friend of these nerds, just have to say, ah, okay, I trust this server because it's my friends and I trust my friend naturally because we're social animals. And to give social animals like Homo sapiens an incentive to contribute to the network is not hard if you can make them see what they're contributing. If you can make them see, okay, this is our network, we built this up ourselves. Okay, somebody else built the organizational structures imminent to the software, but the whole infrastructure that we're using to run, uh, to, to send our messages is run by ourselves. It's running on my computer, on my desktop, it's running on my smartphone, it's running on the server of a friend. This, this is owned by the collective, by us. And not only by your friends out of Germany or your friends from Spain, but collectively owned by everybody. So right now we're facing the problem. We want to build a global communications infrastructure, but we still have nation states and most of the funding models still are, or the, most of the public funding models are still um, bound to nation states or as, uh, um, associations of nation states like the USA or the EU. And we somehow have to find funding models for public infrastructure that is globally, or this is spanning the whole world, to, to fund it by the people's money that are actually living in these constructs. So we have to support more of the NGOs that are already, le are already there, like the FSFE, the FSF, uh, the, the Linux uh, initiative, and everybody who's building free infrastructure that we can just install, because the machines are already there. Right now we're at the point, is it feedback? Yeah, probably. Uh, right now we're at a point where the, the advancement of technology doesn't lie only in um, building more massive structures or giving more power into anything, running higher voltages or stuff. It's the, the advancement, advancements lies in being more intelligent to find more efficient organizational structures for data. So we can just think of stuff, implement it and make it happen. We don't have to build anything. It doesn't, it just costs person hours. And if we can think of something that is smarter than the old stuff and we can still run it on our universal calculators, which these machines just are, and you can run everything on it, what Turing already proved 200 years ago, or no, 100, yeah, what Turing proved already. So just let us be smarter, cooperate more, and give us free and open infrastructure that everybody can use. Devise probably not business models, but community models to fund this. Just get some friends together and Try to find out which organizations you can uh, support or where you can find out more of this stuff. And you, you, can, you can make it, you can improve the internet by your own actions pretty easily. Don't use one-click file hosters if you want to upload or download big files. Just use BitTorrent. 
then you're contributing to, your, to the network. And if everybody would just use BitTorrent, we wouldn't have any problems with downloading and uploading large albums of photos or homemade movies or whatever. You can just share everything that you have. And if you have 10,000 people seeding one file or 100 people would be enough, you can download it even faster than from one of these one-click share hosts and you're not dependent on anything. You can set up mail service yourself. It's not hard. Probably lots of the people that are here now could probably set up a mail server. And if you can't, ask a friend because you probably have a friend who has a mail server and then use that instead of Google Mail or Hotmail or whatever. Use, use the old stuff because the old stuff doesn't get old. The old stuff gets improved also. It just probably isn't as sexy. And this is why I want to call out to all the designers out there because we have lots of highly motivated free software uh, designers and engineers and developers but somehow as I feel and probably lots of others feel there's a problem in the communication between the developers and the designers that make the UIs and you the UIs are probably or are as important as the software running below because if my mother can't understand the UI she won't use the software my mother can understand Facebook, but my mother can probably not set up an email server. So we have a problem there. We need to improve the usability as well as the organizational structures underlying the network. So it's again collaboration. So if you know designer friends and you're developing some software that could contribute to making the internet not TV, ask your designer friends, try to convince them to work together with us. Probably. Yeah, get some funding from some public sponsors because th the money is actually there. We have, we don't have a lot of public funding, but we have public funding to make this happen, and we just have to ask. Most of the times, so yeah, go ask, go build the internet, cooperate, be friends. I guess we're gonna we're gonna open it up for questions in a minute. So I just want yeah. to take a minute to just make a little kind of a, a bit of a closing, yeah. a closing statement. That's um, probably cool. Starting uh, starting from uh, what Daniel was talking about 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 design and how like you know, uh, you know, one thing you always hear is that is that you know people pe people say things like, well you know people use Facebook is because it's so easy to use, whereas in Usenet it's so hard to use, right? But um, there's uh, there, there's a concept in the philosophy of technology that's called the paradox of the frame. And what the paradox of the frame t t tells us is, is that uh, it's, wrong to, it's wrong to believe that success follows efficiency. A lot of people believe, it's, it's, very, it's very intuitive, that things that are efficient therefore become successful. Right? In actual fact, um, success leads to efficiency. And, 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 what, and what is meant by that is, that is that platforms and technologies and approaches and sciences are chosen because of their social utility for one reason or another, because of, it, because of powerful groups that back them or because of legal or financial advantage that they have. And because they're chosen, they're invested in, and so they iterate to success. They become, they, become, they become efficient because they were successful. They don't become successful because they were efficient, right? So this is why we have to understand Facebook has a much nicer user interface. It's not that a centralized platform like Facebook is inherently better suited for a nice interface. Not that I think it's very nice, but anyway. Um, it's, that, it's that efficiency follows success. It's because it was successful, and successful in this case means it got investment, therefore it became efficient. Um, so we sit, we sit at a kind of very important crossroads in the evolution of networks. We, talk, we, we, we heard from Daniel about the vision of SecuShare and this idea of using the, your own computers, your own data, your own network connections in order to, in order to, uh, in order to communicate and build things forward. But I mean, not only are there funding issues for this kind of thing, there's an active war over control of the internet right now. Like right now, you still have the ability to run your own software on your computer, right? This is, this is an ability we should not take for granted. Cory Doctorow gave a talk uh, at Republica, and he's talked recently about the war against general computing. I think this is really important to understand, is, is that when you see your iPhone, that's the future that, that, the, that, the, inter, that the industry uh, wants you to have. They want it completely controlled, which applications you can use, what information they can share. So as he described this universal calculator, of course that's what it is. 
but there's very strong efforts with trusted computing to, and other platforms to lock it down, to completely control what you can do. So even the opportunity to run, even the opportunity to run software like SecuShare, never mind how to fund it, but actually the ability to run it is already a political struggle that we have to engage with, even if to keep that opportunity open. And I think that's that's uh, that's all I'll say for now. And we'll, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. Any questions? We have a microphone here. Uh, you were talking before about um, options for sort of an alternate Facebook, for example, sharing photos with your friends and other people. And I take on board what you were saying about usability and efficiency, but at the same time is part of the reason why we use these centralized platforms because everyone else is using them at the same time. If I go away and set up a file hosting website with some friends of mine, well, they can't then easily share those photos to everyone that just clicks on it because no one is clicking on it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in communication and network uh, economics, uh, the, the, the value of the network is the, based on the size of the network. That, that's what gives the network value is the number, of the, the number of people you can reach with that network. But again, it's just like the design example. The reason Facebook is so big is because it was well-funded so that I could promote, support, develop, and uh, reach out to customers, whereas in a smaller organization that was volunteer run or perhaps the recipient of some grants or public funds would not have recourse to the same kind of resources. So even though it may be more efficient, like SecuShare is far more efficient than Facebook because it uses the boundary of the network instead of the core of the network. However, SecuShare is funded by a few small grants and a lot of volunteer contributions. No, it's not funded. Not funded at all, okay, right. I thought, I thought uh, Howland Foundation, no? Anyway. Um, but, uh, but, so the point is, is that Facebook has hundreds of engineers that have full-time jobs, huge data centers, advertising, salespeople, marketing people, community support, community people, uh, public relations people to build that billions of networks, right? So, like the, um, the economist Dallas Smythe, who did a lot of work on uh, the economics of communication, described the term called audience commodity, which is an important term. I think most people have heard the phrase now, which is kind of a paraphrase of, uh, of Dallas Smythe, that if you're, not paying, if you're not paying for the service, then you're not the customer, you're the product, right? Or you're producing the product, which is data. This is probably to, to phrase it better, but then uh, we, we also had the process, do you know, remember MySpace? MySpace was pretty big in its day, and everybody was on MySpace, but then Facebook came and somehow developed better. So, we guess Facebook won't be there forever, and also all the technologies that we invent right now will not be there forever. There will be always some fluent change in technology use, and the, the real question there is how can we direct it in the right direction? Sure, nobody should ever claim to be right, but we... <laughs> We think we are right because we are promoting flat hierarchies that empower people more than centralized systems with really steep hierarchies where few people are in charge. And we think the more people you can get in charge, the better. This is probably not right, but I feel it's right, so I want to promote this. And everybody who, who feels the same way will probably use the decentralized platforms once they're ready. And we guess SecuShare could be usable in a year or so, or half a year if we're really lucky. So it's really, in the end, the decision of the user and the early adopters. Because if you can get enough early adopters who can tell their friends, hey, you should stop using Facebook because this platform is much cooler. And I already have five friends there. And if it's, it's not even... Uh, important how many people are there but how many people of your inner circle are there if your 10 best friends are on one platform you probably won't care that your 90 not so good friends are not there you will probably still check out Facebook once a week or so we don't care as long as you don't only rely on Facebook for your communication if you still use email IRC ICQ Jabber ICQ probably not but Jabber or whatever it's okay. If you only know how to use Facebook and Facebook shuts your account down, not so good. So keep the networks heterogeneous and 
We are right now developing some peer-to-peer -peer communication system called Checkershare. But please, please don't sit back and think, oh, these guys are doing it. Please come up with ideas of your own because Secureshare will be attackable also because every system is attackable. And if we have a homogeneous system on the internet and we have only one alternative to centralized systems, this alternative would probably be attacked. And if they find some way, we have a problem. We need a fallback solution, as always. Or we need to improve. We probably need both because, yeah, security is always hard. So, yeah. Is it, is it open already for beta or is it...? Uh, not yet. We are in pre-prototype stage, but uh, one deadline is uh, for the 29C3 this year. So um, if it's ready then, we will have a talk there and you will probably get to know of it. And the interface will probably be not as uh, nice as Facebook, but the backend will work and the people sitting here could probably already use it. So. Um, is it possible to register already for a, for a beta version or do uh, you have something... Th there will be not, no registration because it's decentralized. If you don't friend us, if you don't connect to us, we won't even know that you're using the software. And we will not be able to exclude anybody. We will just provide the organizational logic. And you will run it, if you run it in Timbuktu, and you only connect to your Timbuktu friends, it, the traffic will not leave Timbuktu. It will probably not go through any of the mirroring sites of the NSA if you don't use US routers. So you can run it, you can run it even over Wi-Fi. So if you just set up some Wi-Fi nodes, you can use this to distribute your content. But uh, yeah, if you're interested, uh, we have a mailing list on secushare.org, S-E-C-U-Share.org. And yeah, this one. And the announcements will go over there. The mailing list is not really active right now because uh, we don't have so many users yet, more or less just five developers who are using it. But uh, as far as we have one stable version, you will get an email and then you can put Facebook to the, yeah, where it belongs. Hooray, hooray. Any more questions? No more? Yes, yeah, of course, the other side. Do, do, do. Hi, I'm Christian. Um, I have a question about, I think the ideas you, you talk about are really good, but if you look at the other side of the stage, um, the people on the other side tell everybody how to become a millionaire by doing it as Facebook does it. So what is the best way to actually merge those two sides of the stage? Because this is the big problem. This is the, the big flaw in the whole communication. The people from over there need to teach the people over here how to do the marketing, the media, and, and, and open up the whole software they develop as a big product that is really cool for everybody. The people on the other side need to learn how to do it in an open, in a, in a, in a free way, uh, without actually developing some monopolies that, that uh, burden everybody in the end. So how, how to build the bridges between those two stages? Yeah, uh, this is, as he stated, a really big problem because uh, in, the, in the current system, we don't say capitalism is the root of all evil, but it creates some problems. It creates the problem of making money of a decentralized platform where you don't gather data. If all the data is residing on your systems, like on the user's computers, nobody can see what's being talked about. It's really hard to put advertisements in there. So you will probably be able to do something like the Red Hat business model where you sell support and services to uh, companies. But as we know, Red Hat made uh, one billion of uh, money flowing through the company first last year. And Facebook is already doing, what, several billions, 20 billions and for some time. So these are models that grow much slower and that cannot probably feed the, the market demand. Yeah, but it's on the other side. And, and, and things like, things like um, Red Hat are also kind of, uh, kind of an anomaly anyway, because companies like Red Hat were more or less bootstrapped, which means, which means that they're kind of like the mythical starting in your garage kind of company that, uh, that capitalism likes to promote as kind of an ideal. But these, these companies are actually very rare. The, the vast majority of companies were not bootstrapped. They were invested in and they were given, a, and they were given millions of dollars to get started. So they had the, they had the ability to 
come into the market, give their product away for free without ever thinking of having to make revenue. And as you can imagine, this is a really tremendous like, advantage, right? So like the most successful company since Red Hat in the kind of the open space field is probably Canonical. Um, and of course, Canonical comes from uh, kind of like a hobby farm for a billionaire that made his money in the SSL racket, right? Right, so it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to bridge that gap. If you look at history, like how, how have we built things that can't be built by the profit model, that's been done with public funds, right? And so I think that the way to answer this question is to not, is to, that we, we have to understand that the only way we can have free and open communication systems that don't survey, that don't control, that don't monitor, and that don't try to control the behavior of their users is if we do that publicly. But when we say publicly now, we have to ask what that question means. As Daniel, as Daniel said earlier, it's unclear that the nation state is a sustainable public forum in an, er in an era of international communications where, where national borders are easily crossed. I mean, when we had mail system and the phone system, we had the idea of local and international. So you're making a local phone call or you're making an international phone call. These were very different things because of the way the infra infrastructure was built and interconnected. But when you're sending an email, nobody thinks I'm sending a local email or an international email. You're just sending an email, right? And so, and so these, for these kinds of systems don't readily fit in to the public form of the nation state. So I think the big question of our age is what are our new public forms going to look like? How are we going to do things together to accomplish common social objectives, right? How are we, how are we going to exercise our social rights to determine economic and technological and social outcomes? And that question, I think, is much more, is much more powerful than, than thinking of how can we fund a particular open source project. Yeah, there was another question. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, um, as nowadays the ISP uh, providers or the internet providers, uh, yeah, tell you how much internet you have, how much upload, how much download. Um, uh, there is the uh, yeah. Can you put it more to your mouth? Uh, the bottle, uh, the bottleneck is at the ISP. So, um, how would you? Uh, yeah, increase the upload or to make a yeah, symmetric network. Uh, well, the thing is, um, your ADSL works by dividing the frequency bands. You have two frequency bands, one for upstream and one for downstream, and you can modulate or you can choose where you want to divide them. So if you get 32 megabit down and 2 megabit up, you can could as well just take all these 34 megabits and get 17 symmetric. It's just a choice. And it, or, or adaptive, like choosing it. I think in the early days you could even at QSC, for example, choose it in a web interface, what you wanted to have. Because it's just an electronic switch. You could probably even remote configure it. And it probably wasn't just the evil, we will make you all consumers and assimilate you to the Borg and you will not be able to send anything. It was um, what people use it most for. and people probably used it most for consuming because consuming is much easier than producing. It's much easier to read a text than to write a text. It's much easier to watch a movie than to make a movie. So it was probably just a natural thought to give the people to more bandwidth to receive than to send. But right now we have the problem that everybody starts sending out more as it becomes easier because in the, in the beginning you had to set up a web server but you could easily use AOL to ac access these web servers from your Windows box, which didn't even have the capability because it wasn't multi-user compatible. And yeah, but this is another story. And the, the, the problem now is um, we had, in the early days of the internet, when only universities and military facilities were connected to the internet, a little ISPs sprung up, which were called individual, individual networks. These were community-owned ISPs where you were actually working on giving the people the internet and there you could decide how you want to give it to the people so we should try again which also depends on the political level to build more community owned infrastructure again it's probably hard to to build a community owned transatlantic cable because it's really really expensive but if we would find some organizational structure where everybody put, could just subscribe and say, hi, I like the internet, I want to be a member and I want to pay 30 euros a day, uh, 30 euros a month, because 
I can afford it. I want to support publicly owned infrastructure for the internet. But then, or you say, I'm, I'm poor, I just have five euros per, per month, but take them. We could probably set up, at least in densely populated areas, we could probably lay down our own wires in a few years. And this is important. Which is also important is to, to be, be able to produce technology again, because as Dimitri said already, we have the problem with trusted platforms. We have iPhones, we have iDevices, we have the first Windows 8 netbooks, which are um, system locked, so you can just run Windows 8 on it, because it's cryptographically uh, yeah, signed, and you cannot run everything that, anything that is not signed. In the worst case, in the absolutely worst case, in some years, you will probably not be able to get unlocked devices anymore. So we, you will probably not be able to run Linux or uh, BitTorrent or whatever on your computer. So we have to uh, get in the capability again to build these ourselves. We have to stick our heads together, probably even with nation, nation states and NGOs and whatnot, or big corporations. Actually, it's, it doesn't matter who we work together. It's just important that we work together to build these things ourselves and to know what they're doing. Because right now, we're probably running free software where we know what the kernel does, where we know what the uh, oper rest of the operating system does, but we have no clue what the Ethernet card does. We have no clue what the Ethernet firmware does. We have no clue what the Wi-Fi firmware and chip do. We, have, we don't even have a clue what our processes do even if we have these anti-theft and remote administration extensions, which are pretty pr practically just a second processor running all the time, which you don't have access to, which in turn has full memory access, which can access all network devices, which can impersonate a human interface device, which probably has some something that's open to the network or can be compromised so it's open to the network so your computer can be remote controlled by default. There is loads and loads of problems with the security of machines right now. The, the, if you want to have secure storage for your digital data, you should probably take a C64. These were designed when people were still not thinking, oh, how could we survey this platform more efficiently? How could we make this platform, yeah, better, better, and yeah. So we need free software, we need free hardware, we need public infrastructure, we need open infrastructure without any discrimination, and we have to put away the idea that nation, national borders apply to the internet. For example, there's a really nice policy in Sweden, as I just heard yesterday, the, 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 Secret services of Sweden are allowed to check or monitor all the traffic that leaves Sweden. They are not allowed to monitor traffic internal of Sweden. But as you know, most of the core servers are not in Sweden. So probably 95% or 99% of the traffic from Sweden go through the border and then back again. So this is probably stupid. We should think about that and try to work on the political level too because as, as lots of the tech people think, politics stink, and if you go into politics, you start to stink also after some time. This might be the case if you do it wrong, but we hope it's not the case if you do it right. So, um, yeah, we, we have to be active on all the fronts, socially, politically, and technologically. Tell your people what to, uh, how to use uh, the right software again. Teach your friends, teach your parents, build the stuff and then go protest or develop laws and whatnot. Yeah, become active, cooperate, be friends and stuff. Still some questions left? One. Actu actually, we are kind of running out of, the, of time. Kind of or really running out? Please come to an end. Okay, so okay, one la question. Last question. <laughs> maybe, maybe a short question and a short answer. Yeah. Just on the matter of privacy, especially in regards to government, there's been a lot of changes in law to make it easier to, you know, intercept the emails, view your web traffic. Where do you see, see this leading eventually? Do you think we will go back to having more privacy or do you think we will end up with the government knowing exactly what we do? See, the interesting thing here is that, um, first of all, those privacy issues and the fights against those legislation are very important. Organizations like Le Quadrature de Net and EFF that are fighting against these uh, privacy invasive laws are doing very good work. Um, but that is actually 
the, the, the minor threat because in the public sphere we can still fight and even if we lose a lot of the battles because of funding asymmetry we win some of them it's a public fight when you use a private a platform like Facebook or Twitter, you actually have no rights to fight for. Your data is already being invaded. So commercialization is a much bigger threat than government invasiveness. In fact, commercialization is more or less made privacy irrelevant because it doesn't really matter what rights you have on the public internet. You have none of those rights on Facebook or Twitter's servers. And so the more data that goes through these kinds of centralized platforms, the less important it becomes. These fights over privacy started in the 90s, in a time when the internet was decentralized, in a time when legislation had to be coercive, like things like the, DL, like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act came at a time when I could have your video on my website and you have to sue me to force me to take it down from my website, right? So this requires a coercive law because it's a public internet. But now that I don't have a website, I just have a Facebook page, and on my Facebook page, they never have to talk to me to take the video down. All they have to do is talk to Facebook. In fact, as part of Facebook's investment, part of the criteria is that they work with rights holders and give them, and give them access to their back end. Same with YouTube, same with all other centralized platforms. So major rights holders actually can go into YouTube and take your video down without ever even talking to a YouTube engineer. Right? And, they don't need, and they don't need any legislation to do so because they do so based on their agreement with the platform. Right? So commercialization is a much bigger threat, while privacy should still be fought for, of course. Also encryption, because uh, yeah, you know, if the data goes over the wire and it's not encrypted, anybody can listen in. And, but you shouldn't just say, okay, we'll encrypt everything and fuck the law, because if you fuck the law, it will get worse. So fight for your rights and use encryption. And everybody should use encryption because if everybody is talking to his grandmother encryptedly, yeah, more noise and stuff. Just, just encrypt everything. Okay, thank you very much. It was very interesting. So we have one more yeah. talk. Thanks for listening, by the way. <laughs> So we have one more talk tonight coming up and uh, so we make a short break, five minutes and then we're going to um, talk about, um, op 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 about a very interesting open banking project. We have here uh, Simon Redfern. Here in five minutes we're going to start.